All right, man. We're back again. Man, I hope everybody had a good holiday break. Enjoy time with the family. A little time off. If you didn't get time off, well, I apologize. But I know, you know, we're here for one reason, baby. We love the Oklahoma City Thunder. Dave, George, that's right, we got another guest. We got George back on the show. Last time we had him on the show, it was in November. We were up at the lake fishing. Now, it's too cold to fish, man. It's ice everywhere. <laughs> What's up, George? How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I, you know, enjoyed the holiday. Get a little bit of time off. Um, I hope you guys Good. enjoy the holiday as well. You can take care oh, of yeah. your stuff, you know. And uh, later on, take the family uh, downtown Savannah and check out some sites out there. So looking forward to having oh, a good, beautiful good, area. Uh, time off this week. Dude, I got to tell you probably. this about Savannah. is uh, When I went down to Savannah, um, when I lived in Georgia, there in Augusta for a long time, I... We would go probably once a month to Savannah. And so we're standing out there. We're listening to some guy that was talking about Savannah and the history of Savannah. And he was talking about the British invasion and them coming up and down the coast and burning every single city. And the British commander gets to uh, um, Savannah and he says, nobody will lay a hand on Savannah. It is too beautiful to burn. And it was the only city on the coast that was not burned during the British invasion, I believe, of uh, 1812. So... Crazy story, but Savannah is one of those truly spectacular places. The the stones, the the bricks on the ground, it's it's truly an, an unbelievable place to go and, and, and really spend some time at. So hope you have fun, Definitely. man. Definitely. So. Absolutely, man. So I I haven't been to Savannah, but I've been on the other side of the river of Savannah. So Dave, you took me there one time. But we're we're here. Because we love the Thunder, and that's what we want to make sure we're focusing on. And right before we hit record and started talking, we were kind of going down memory lane a little bit and talking about all the, the, the recent teams we've seen. Every year is a new team. Every year is a new group of players. But just a couple of short years ago, we were looking at a team that had some incredible playoff experience, and they were kind of being discounted. They pushed the Rockets to Game 7. Um, George, you were mentioning Adams and... Chris Paul, Dennis Schroeder, really being some vets, uh, Gallinari, that we could lean on. And that was a special year, but now we're much younger. But in a way, like we're in a lot better position, right, at the same time? Yeah, we're deeper, man. If you think about that team that was designed with um, um, Coach Don um, as the coach, it was really designed around the, the thickness of the starting group, you know? <laughs> and it didn't get really that much better off of the bench. I mean, we had a sixth man. But after that, it was it was pretty rough, you know. And I think that's the, the difference is is the teams that Sam Presti has put together in the past haven't had this depth, and this depth is is the biggest issue that I see teams having with right now. Absolutely, man. You got ten on any given night, and we are used to seeing three or four players sitting out and still being able to go ten deep. Um, and we we have guys that are in our G League system right now that have only seen a few minutes. Some of them are rookies. Some of them, you know, are kind of like the Amarui guy where he's he's playing, he can contribute, but it's really about, you know, finding the right situation for him to work into the system. So there's a lot of depth, like you're saying. If you took like a Kenny Hustle or Amarui um, or even like an Isaiah Joe and you were to throw him on that team in 2000 and I'm thinking 19, you know what I mean? Mm. Like that team would be a lot better to have that depth. And we have a whole group of these guys that the blue collar workers that make everything, you know, really smooth. And after that year with Chris Paul and, you know, game seven, we saw Lou Dort break out, you know, then we went into the spot where we were the youngest team, but mm. we had guys like um, Al Hortford, George Hill that were there to kind of steady the hand. Um, halfway through the season, those guys get you know shut down. And we find ourselves in a spot where we're like, oh, my gosh, we got thrown into the deep end of a, of a Olympic-sized pool. But basically, we see the same group of guys with a couple of additions out there now playing at a level that really is, like, even for people who are anticipating growth, it's hard to really kind of comprehend. What do you think the key to that growth has been, George? Well, I think it has to do with the, um, the organization itself. Um, you know, it's a... Uh... What people call like they when it, when the organization first moved there, they often said it was like a college town. So yeah. like since there isn't too many distractions for some of these players, they can solely focus on basketball. 
And, you know, that helps with the development of these young guys and it helps with the development of the veterans, too, because they get here and they're like, you know what, I can, you know, rest on days that I need to rest. I don't have to worry about driving three hours just to get a cheeseburger or something like that, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the vets like it. The young guys can focus on their game. And uh, it's just it's just the way that the organization is built. Absolutely. And Dave, we were mentioning or texting each other a little bit ago. Like we're watching all these young players be melded into this organization, but now we're kind of like looking at a player like Josh Giddy, where we've seen hmm. about a year worth of games now all together, 80 plus games that he's played now for us. So like, how does his progression kind of like, how is that tied to the team's success? And we're like, how, even though his numbers aren't like blowing us away, what progression have you seen from him? Yeah, well, it, it's it's more of, of adapting to exactly what we need on that floor um, at any given time. Uh, you always need one of those pieces on that. It's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of, of sorts. Um, and Josh Giddy, the way he's able to play the, the four position um, all the way to the point guard position, seamlessly, you know, like he's done his entire career, is truly spectacular. It, it allows us to have mismatches everywhere on the court. And so when you're talking about Josh Giddy getting better and you're talking about the success he's had – um, as developing as a player, you can't help but understand what he's being asked to do and how different it is um, than when he first started. And if you think about that, when he came out last year and, and, and started playing after uh, the, the draft, you could see this this player starting to catch, you know, catch wind. And all of a sudden, boom, he had a great game. And then, boom, did something else. And February came along. What happens? Shea goes down. Josh Giddy does some amazing things. And it's like, okay. And they even go to Shea and say, Shea, we're thinking about putting the ball more in Josh's hands. And why was that even, you know, plausibility? It was because they hadn't seen Shea step up to that next level. If Shea's going to average 22 to 25 points a game, right, then he's better off doing that as the shooting guard and letting Josh Giddy run that point guard position. But Shea took his game up to the next level, allowing him to stay in that point guard position, really forcing the Thunder's hand in that decision which I love. It's allowed Josh Giddy to move off of the ball. And that's why when you're looking at his development, you have to stop and say, you know, is this um, uh, this year of development, has it been bad for Josh Giddy in the long run? Uh, no. Is it made it, his development slow down slightly from moving from point guard to shooting guard to small forward to power forward? Maybe. But when you're looking at the longevity of his career and what he's going to be able to create and do for himself, it's going to be incredibly amazing for him that that we could plug him in in one through four without without having an issue and, and and the fact that josh will be able to know it by the back of his hand and that's what josh is doing is like the, all the offense all the defense is he's getting to know it one through four like the back of his hand and as as he's developing more and more you'll see it start seeing as it's clicking more like really the true the development that's happening and again it's just it's it's like you're looking at his development with with sunglasses on you know, and, and, and I and I feel like that with a lot of these guys right now is because we're forcing them to play different positions that, you know, their development's not going to be like a whoop, straight up spike and then straight down. Right. It's going to go slide up, 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 up. And it's going to peak. You know, it's going to take a little longer to peak. But that's what we want. We don't want guys coming out there at 22, 23 years old peaking. <laughs> you know, we don't want that. We want guys to take their um, longevity and scoot that up and get that that peaking to 26, 28, someplace in that range right there. That's what we're going for. And that's what we're watching with Josh Giddy is that that patience is happening. So with him spending more time being a playmaker, George, like what do you think the next few years will look like for him? Mm, that's a great question. So hmm. um, I think he already is really um, – developed a lot of that non-verbal communication uh if you guys notice that um there's often times where he makes a pass where he can just give a like a glance to either door or yeah. kenny hustle um so this, it's the yeah, looks man yeah so th the next part of his development is uh i think he's just getting those things that he's already good at to to take them to the next level so his mm -hmm. rebounding those passes um, you know, of course, his shooting is looking a lot better. I'll I'll say this: uh, there was a three pointer. I think it was the last game where Shea tosses it back to um to Giddy, 
and Giddy goes for the three, and Shea does not look at the basket. Shea is focused at, at Josh's hand, and he looks at mm-hmm. his hand, he goes, and he just kind of gives like a yup, and then boom, Giddy hits that three-pointer. I think it was the last game. It could have been the game before yeah, that. I think you're right. I remember. I think I remember yeah, the same I thing. Was man, like, yeah, I sure. was like, look at how – I, th- I was talk- talking to my wife. I was like, look at how Shea is looking at Giddy's hand when he shoots it. Mm-hmm. And he can, they can tell mm-hmm. they've been working. They have – Giddy has been working. So I think his next steps um, are going to be the passing, uh, which is already good, the rebounding, which is great. And, uh, and you know, he's working on his shooting. It's probably going to take a little bit of time. But maybe in two years, he'll be a great shooter. Yeah, and I, I want to jump in here, Mark. I want to say something about what you just said there is it's rebounding off of the, the release. Um, that is the key to what's happening with this team. And you're watching across the board. Kenny Hustle started it off right. He's the one that taught these guys how to do this. And I'm sure this coaching staff as well has been working with them. But it's how I taught um, uh, rebounding. Offense rebound, defense rebound, it didn't matter. You could watch a player's shot and in 10 shots know exactly what their shot is doing. You know how it's going in, which side it's going off. You know when they lean a certain way. It's, there's so much t- um, tells that, that you have to stop and look at. So for me, when I'm a rebounder and I'm teaching rebounding, it's all about the release. It's all about how their hand goes and how the ball um, releases off their hands. And I'm telling you guys, if you do it like that, six out of 10 times, you can get really close to that ball. And sometimes it's just going to be out of reach, but you're putting yourself in the right position for that offensive rebound. And that's what Shea was doing there is he's watching the release. If, if it was going short, you know Shea was going to crash that board because Josh is getting back. But that's what I love about how these guys are um, teaching inside the coaching staff how to rebound is, is rebound off of the release. You go and, and you watch the release and then you go to where the ball's going because it, it's next level. You don't see a lot of teams teaching that. Yeah, absolutely. Moving to where the ball is is headed through experience. But when you listen to the greats talk about rebounding, you know, they all kind of like talk about knowing where the ball's going before it goes there as a big part of it, just by knowing their players like Dennis Rodman. Mm. Those types of guys are always really excellent at that. But, you know, after this last game, um, there's a lot to talk about. Shea goes for a new career high, right? (laughs) Does it really in a unspectacular way, if you will, just because... Quiet. There we go. Quiet. It was spectacular in so many ways, but it was just like some of the guys didn't even know it was his career high. Like I saw them in the post game interviews, and it was just it w- it was really kind of like an accumulation. It's Shea. Of, oh, yeah, he exactly. did it Shea style, man. He did it Shea style, and but uh, on top of that, so I'll let you take it from here in a second. But overall, as a team, like we've seen such an increase of competitiveness. Like we're going nine rounds. We're going twelve rounds now. We're trading blows back and forth and we're, we're watching these games play out all the way to the last second and it's been spectacular i think five games in a row that have all been like final play basically and even the ones before that they were they were all close i i just can't remember much before that it's, they they just keep happening so talk about shay's career high 45 i think is what he 44, 44. and talk about the overall competitiveness of this team and how it's increased as the season's gone on. George, I'll let you go first, man. Uh, are we talking about uh, Shea? He's 44? Yeah, Shea's 44. Yeah, so, I mean, he lives at the free throw line these days. He gets, what, at least half of them sometimes. I think he had 19 free throws a few games ago. Um, yeah. He was incredible against the Blazers in both of those games. And then, you know, against New Orleans, it was going to be a test. New Orleans is one of the best teams in the NBA. And, I mean, we had him. We were right there. Uh, We had him against the ropes. And we had a really good look also at the end. Um, But, you know, it's just incredible. As Shea, SGA, I think he's reached a level where, you know, he's getting those points and you don't realize he has those points. That's what a superstar does. That's what Kevin Durant did. That's what LeBron LeBron does. The you know they get those points and you don't even oh oh you look up wow they have thirty seven right now oh my goodness he ended with thirty five like it's just that's what superstars do and uh, I think he's going to be an all star this year and uh, his trajectory is only up right now so I'm really excited to have him on the team for sure yeah and I, I echo what you said getting to the free throw line has been crucial for him every game this season and the way he's consistently getting there. uh, You know, we talked about early in the year, he wasn't getting the calls 
that the All Star um, uh, All Stars get the, uh, uh, the those calls. You know, like the um, we call it the All Star call, um, and he wasn't getting those calls. Now you're seeing that switch that he's getting those calls. But the other day playing against the Pelicans, he only had made seven free throws of his nine. Like he didn't live and die from the free throw line, and he had 44 points. That's what was so impressive to me was he didn't put 15 free throws up on the you know free throw line and get those 15 easy buckets like what I would call the James Harden way of getting to 30 points, you know, is hitting 15 free throws and hitting five threes. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't do that, you know? Like, he was out there getting to the hold, hitting his mid-jumpers, his yeah. fadeaways. Like, like it was on full expl- um, display of what he can do. Full display. Mm-hmm. Like, there was three for four from three-point range. He was getting rebounds. He had, like, ten rebounds, one offensive, nine defensive, six assists. The way he was able to just go inside the game, go out of the lane, get to the block, get outside of the block, get the passes right. I mean, there was so much that he brought. It was truly spectacular. And, you know, there's a couple times that he didn't get the assist, but there needs to be an assist for a hockey assist. He recognized that if he passed the ball here, that Josh Giddy was going to see that guy wide open in the corner. And and, and those are the things that, that matter is that when you have a team player that's unselfish like Shea, it, he doesn't care about that assist. He cares about the wide open bucket that he's going to get from passing it to Josh Giddy, and that is what a team player is all about. And it makes me so mad when we hear people talk about uh, Shea being selfish player. You know, like like I, I don't get it. Like, yes, does he take uh, you know some uh, a, t- a ton of shots sometimes? Sure, twenty nine shots. Okay, the other night he has scored forty four points in twenty nine shots. Right? To me, these are worth it. You, you can't have a superstar on your team and expect him to take under 20 shots a game, you know? But Shea could do that and average or get 30 points in a game. It's because of the way he plays his game. And to me, some people are going to look at it as selfish, and I'm going to look at it as a complete domination of the game because the stats that he's putting up are just are, are video game stats right now, you know, like are, are truly spectacular. And – like people are talking about this player averaging thirty something points a game for ten, you know, ten games or whatever, and I'm like, man, we're, we're what thirty something Almost games the into season. the season? Yeah, thirty two games into the season, thirty three games in the season, and he's putting out insane mm-hmm. numbers right now, yeah. guys. Like he's averaging almost thirty one points a game. Like, like the stuff that he's doing isn't like a ten game block. Like, oh, look at how great this one player is playing in these ten games. It's an entire fucking season that he's been putting up these numbers, and it's it's really impressive. And I got to say, it's sexy, and it makes me want to watch these Thunder um, Thunder guys yeah. more. I'll add this real quick. Uh, his poise. SGA has this incredible poise, and I think he really learned a lot of that from Chris Paul that one year. Um, mm. you know, You're right. And he also had, when he was on the Clippers, he had the same coach. I think Doc Rivers was over there when he was over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can tell that a lot of that from Chris Paul and Doc Rivers is still in him. Because he has this incredible little mid-range shot that he takes with no jitters, no shakes. And, you know, just the game winner he had against Portland on Monday, last mm. Monday. Um, he, so he, was, he was excited, but he knew, hey, we're playing the same team in, you know, in a couple of days. So he was like, yeah, he put up his little, okay, yeah, we won. But let's not get too hyped because we're playing the same exact team here in a couple of days. So he has this level of maturity right now for a young man. And it's just, uh, mm. real, like I said, I'm real excited to have this guy on the team. Yeah, he's the star in the NBA that I would pick if I was starting a team. I've gotten into it some people over time talking about, like, Luka and Ja. And I understand why you would want to go with some of these guys. But in the end, Bro, um, I, Shea, I, I, I got to stop with it. It's Shea. Ja, why would you ever pick Ja over Shea? He's special. He can never why. stay healthy. I know, but like, 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 I'm sorry, but like, if you want to start a team and you're saying I need to have a player for 70 games, you know that you know. Listen, Shea could have got 70 games in the last two seasons easily with us if it was if we were going for a playoff, right? But we weren't. So here's the thing: is that I, I, I look at Jaha, I don't ever see him making 75 games in a season in his entire career. I just don't. And if he does, it will be an MVP caliber season, but it'll be a lot like um, Anthony Davis. You know, like once in a while you'll have a bloop or Damian Lillard. I mean, Ja could be the next Damian Lillard of the league. Like MVP type caliber player when he plays. I mean, I, th- I think there's a point to that. And it's funny because one guy that we're not mentioning anymore as maybe being ahead of Shea is Trey Young. And Trey Young maybe 
still like more of an established star. Probably is right. He's played All Star games and things like that. So played in the playoffs a few. But times, I just so. feel like Shea just keeps passing the next guy, the next guy, and now we're like, how many guys are really in front of Shea? Yeah. And I don't even know. Like I don't know the answer to that question, but I would say it's a lot less than where we started out the year. And let's face it, Shea had a really good end of the season. Um, before he got shut down, I mean, the guy was averaging over 30 a game where he scored like at least 30 a game, I think 15 or something. I'm making up a number, but it was crazy number of games in the row at the end of the season. So I kept saying, I felt like the end of last season was the beginning of his all-star campaign for this season. Mm -hmm. Well, he turned it up a notch this season. And when you look at him, like you, st you can't help but like think about the greats in their prime. And it's like, he's still a little young, but like, he just looks like a legit generational star now. And that's something that like watching that transformation right in front of our eyes, that's what this is all about. Right. Well, and, and something you just brought up the greats, you know, people kind of like joke about us about um, talking about the greats, or comparing the greats. Right. But here's the thing about comparing the greats with the players that we have now and any players in general is the greats are what the goal is. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you're comparing it to a great, it's you're comparing maybe the trajectory, maybe the style of play, maybe this or that, right? You're looking at this player and saying, if he has a legitimate 19 year career in the league, 18 year career in the league, injury free and putting up these numbers, he is going to be considered one of the greats of our generation. So for us, that's what, that's what we're always looking at this team. We're looking at which of the players can live up to the greats. And, and if we go out and we'll win three or four or even five um, championships, and then everybody's going to take a step back and be like, okay, this team is full of greats, right? It's not going to be just one great. I mean, you can't look at the the Golden State Warriors, which has been our most recent, um, um, yeah, dynasty, that you could say, right? <laughs> so if you're looking at Golden State and you're saying, look at this dynasty right here, you can't pull them out and say, you know, a lot of these guys aren't going to make it into the Hall of Fame. You know, you can't say that Clay is not going to make it in the Hall of Fame. You know, would Clay make it to the Hall of Fame if he played on a different team? Probably not. You know, Clay, Steph, you know, uh, uh, I mean, look at Green's, look at Green's stats, man. But, you know, he's going to make it to the Hall of Fame. But that's the thing, though, is that, like, these guys are going to be compared to greats. So and then as they age, people are going to compare them to the young guys coming in. So when we're comparing to greats, it's just because we look at each of these players and we try to look at them as the best possible way they can be. And sometimes it doesn't work out. And then you can laugh at us and we're cool with that because, you know, that doesn't bother us. But we want this best out of each of these players. We want to look at Trey Mann and say, man, if Trey Mann could put this together, this is where he could be. This is the type of player that he could be. He could be like Allen Iverson with that crazy step back. And he could be like this player with his defense, like Tishon Prince with his defense. Like he we could add this and this and this, you know, like that's what you want to do with the team. That's how you want to look at them. That's how the positivity that we're bringing. And I, to me, I, I get excited when we talk about a great and Shea, Mark, you know, it makes me excited because I think we are guys. I think we're watching one of the greats starting to bud. And to me, there's nothing greater in watching a sport and having a team that's your team, that's your team, and the star is starting to bud and everybody's being like, hey, hey, hey we want that guy, right? Our our team is full of a bunch of unavailable men, guys. Just remember that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good one. Yeah, for sure, man. So this progression with this team, um, you know, one of the guys that I love talking about is J-Dub. And – he had this game last game that to me goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about competitiveness. I felt like it was one of his best competitive games because when things go well for him early and he gets on a roll, he keeps staying on a roll, but he's had games where he kind of makes a couple of mistakes or the shot doesn't fall, even though it's a good shot. Then he kind of like loses a little bit of aggression. Hmm. I felt like this last game, he started off a bit slow. Now I could be totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how it went. And then he kept trying, he kept pushing it. And then by the end, he was making big time plays. Like I, man, when he dunks the ball, I mean, I think, I think Dr. J, like, I think like, what the fuck? It's like, it's insane but how it's, it's, it's not finesse dunk. It's not like this little tiny little, like I'm not saying Dr. J was a finesse dunker, right? But he never like 
like emphasized a dunk. Whereas you watch J Dub come down that lane, and it's like a punctuation that I haven't seen from a six six guy in a very long time. What I like, what I think about that is, uh, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan, right? And he yeah. has this one movie, uh, I think it's Enter the Dragon, where they go to like some island. Okay. And he's starting the beginning of the movie. He's training a younger, like warrior guy or something like that. And he tells the the young man, you know, it's like, hey, you know, kick or punch or something. And he kicks. And he goes, no, 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 don't do it like that. It's like you need emotional content. And that's exactly mm. what I think that J Dub has. He has that emotional mm. content when he goes in and does his dunks or layups or whatever it is. And it's really important because, uh, you know, you have to have that in order to have that warrior basketball in you and uh he has that little flash in it and i also want to relate that over to his idol kobe bryant and you know kobe bryant was also a big uh bruce lee fan and uh Mm -hmm. you know he took that uh philosophy that bruce lee developed the jeet kune do and he and he put it on the hardwood and uh you know it's 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 just incredible to watch these young guys you know do that type of stuff so Man, yeah, you know that 19... um, he has his the Bruce Lee tattoo, right? On his leg. Who does? J Dub. Oh, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yeah, man. I didn't even know that. Dude. Yeah, I'll have to send you a picture, yeah. man. We'll we'll see if I can find it. Heck that yeah, minute. that's awesome. <laughs> so nineteen nineties, right? You have a young Vince Carter playing against the New York Knicks, all right? Um I'm I'm thinking I'm at the time I'm in, in my teens, early teens, and Vince Carter's a rookie, all right? And if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken, he came off the bench that game. Anyways, he throws down this dunk, all right? And it was like, <gasps> like, like the garden just goes, <gasps> you know, like it was like one of those moments, right? Because like you were talking about the emotional content, right? The emotional contact even with the rim that he has. Um, it's so different. It stops. It's a jaw dropper, you know? Like you're like, okay, like, J Dub dunking, it's like it's almost so raw still. Like he's still learning how to handle his long limbs, you know, like what do I do with this? Oh, I could do that. You know, like we don't know what's gonna end up happening, but that ooh and awing like of that that incredibly athletic dunker, right? He has that. And I I have to go back to when Vince Carter just came back on the scene and everybody was a finesse dunker. You wouldn't really hang on the rim unless you're a big guy. You wouldn't really do stuff like that. Like once in a while, you see John Starks do something really spectacular and there's like, ah, right. Um, but Vince Carter, man, he came down the lane and it was so powerful. Everything was just like, you know, and it was just a six, six guy coming down the lane, you know? And that's what I see with J dub is when he comes down that lane, it's just like this vibration of, of everything else that's around him. Like, Whoa, you know, like, and it's insane, man. Like you can't help but watch it, watch it, and be like, "Where can this go?" Because again, I mean, he he's only been six six, six seven, what is he, six eight, whatever he is, for two years, guys. I mean, his freshman year of college, he was six two, guys. <laughs> like he doesn't know what to do with his limbs. Like I can't even imagine being six two and like normal sized limbs, and all of a sudden being like, boom, six six, seven two limbs. Like what the fuck, <laughs> like. Like, I'll just be like, la, 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 la. like, I don't even know what to say, except that J-Dub is still learning it. And when he puts it all together, and I love the fact that we have two players on our team, Shay and J-Dub, whose favorite basketball players were Kobe Bryant, right? And they both, and they both think that Kobe Bryant was the greatest. I love it, man, because these guys are going out there and giving it their all. And you watch how Kobe played. You watch the, the heart that he had. And the desire to win and putting it all on the line. And if that's who their 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 uh, idol is, bro, like give it up to these guys because they're going to put it all on the line. Like nothing. Like if you think that the Thunder aren't going to win two or three championships over the next fifteen years, then you're fucking stupid. Because these guys, these guys are setting up to have maybe the best duo that we have ever seen in the league in the last thirty or forty years. And and that's saying something because by the time that these guys are peaking. 30 years is going to be that time that Kobe Bryant and Shaq had the league by, by storm. And it's going to be insane that if we can get to this point with these guys that, that everybody else is just watching saying, how can we, how can we mimic what the thunder did? Well, nobody's going to be able to ever do that again, because if you look at how Sam built this team that we have now, it took 
15 right. years. In 2007, it was the first move. Yeah. 2007, guys. What did we do? We had a young 29-year-old Sam Presti. He had a player, Rashad Lewis, that was going and leaving for free agency, and he convinced Rashad Lewis to stay, do a sign-in trade, right? 15 extra million dollars for Lewis to go to Orlando for an extra um, year on the deal, and Orlando got to stay, get Rashad Lewis for an extra um, deal. What did we get in exchange? We get a 9.5 million trade exemption, and we turn that into um, Kurt Thomas and two first-round picks, all right? We'll talk about Kurt Thomas in a second, but first first-round pick that we get it comes in in 2008 with a 24th pick, and that was Serge Ibaka. Think about that, guys. We got Richard Lewis, a $9.5 million exemption, traded for Kurt Thomas, and two first-round picks. It's insane what we were able to trade with Serge Ibaka. You know, we got this the team that we have now because of Serge Ibaka. We yeah. got the team that we have now because of Richard Lewis deal in the first place. But we would have never got a Serge Ibaka if it wasn't for that Richard um, Lewis deal that we did. So here we are, all the way down the line, looking at Shea, looking at J-Dub, who was another one of those players that we got from this trade, um, the Shea trade and the uh, um, uh, PG-13 trade. So, again, it's it started in 2007. So in order for a team to mimic what Sam Presti had to do, they had to see the four, uh, foresight and four vision 15 years down the line. And to be able to re reproduce and re um, replicate this particular trade scenario where we're looking at Richard Lewis turning a, a $9.5 million trade exemption into Shea Gilgis Alexander, J-Dub, Trey Mann, four more draft picks from um, Clippers, another draft, a first-round draft pick from the Heat, um, Poku, we got Grant from this trade, we got uh, Bloodsoe from this trade, we got Quigley from this trade that we traded out, I mean, we could go down the list of may, uh, players that we've seen through this league just because of these, this trade right here. And that's not adding, you know, the uh, Russ trade. That's not adding the Chris Paul trade. That's just adding this one small little piece yeah. of the puzzle that turned out to be crazy. And that's why when you're going to look back and people are like, we're going to try to do what the Thunder did, you're going to laugh at them because it's going to be impossible. Because by the time that even comes out, it's going to be 10 15, 20 years down the road, and Sam Presti's already going to be on, you know, level five of his master plan. World domination of the NBA. And that's it, man. Like, what he's been able to do in the years that it's going to take to, to even come out for what, you know, Paul George, because Sam Presti probably won't keep all of these draft picks from the Clippers. He'll probably trade one down the road, right, for more draft picks down the road. And we're going to see just take 20, 25 years to every single one of these draft picks to come out. And it's insane if you think about it like that. Like it's, yeah, it's crazy to think about the, the distance between like what people think Presti did and what Presti actually right. did. And I think when people try to mimic it, it's gonna be a real problem. Like, what do you think? Like, I mean, Dave, you did a great job laying out the timeline. But George, what do you think about just this this progression going all the way back and everything? You know, the the like you said, the timeline is awesome. I I think of it like a family tree. Kind of, you know, yeah, and, uh, good job, yeah. But I, what I also like is the those other ones, like you mentioned, like the Chris Paul and the Al Horford. And I take the metaphor mm -hmm. is like the the Sam Presti popcorn. When you get microwave popcorn, you get it, you get the kernels, and then you put it yep. in the microwave, and then you press one season, and then boom, the next thing you got is some delicious popcorn. And then we trade that, right. but we kept those kernels at the bottom of the bag. And guess what? We can make more popcorn. So that's the way like oh, yeah. that he's been trading these other guys, these veterans too. Hmm. And we just take yeah. like this old piece of, um, uh, you know, little shrine metal that we found at the garage sale, we polish it up and now we sell it for, you know, 10 times the amount on eBay. And that's what, <laughs> that's hmm. what I feel like he's been yeah. doing with these, uh, these other guys too. So not only do we have that 2007 timeline family tree, but we also have these other little ones that Sam Presti has been developing um, along the line parallel with it. So it's uh, it's many avenues. So like you said, when people try to em emulate, there's there's more than one thing to emulate. It's like he's got four or five folders on his, on his desk and he's just yeah. got them building up. So good luck to any other team that try to, that try to emulate. In fact, no, I take that back. We don't want them to, to try to emulate <laughs> us. 
but it would take us it would take so long yeah, anyways it would take like way the, too the amount the decades it would take in order to set up what sam's done it, that's the key like when you're talking about copying an organization sometimes it's like oh yeah well the lakers is pretty easy you get a really fucking rich person to take over your organization and then you just buy all the good contracts out you know like lakers are easy <laughs> you know like once in a while they'll draft a player and then they'll build the rest of the team around them but we're not the Lakers. We're a small organization that, you know, lives and dies by that, that draft. And it's key to make sure that you have multiple avenues to go through in each draft. And, you know, this next draft is going to be the first time that we don't see multiple picks yet. Yet. Yeah. Um, but I don't I, listen. I just think that that's because Sam Presti is done with this rebuild at this moment, you know, like, Adding us another piece is, is cool, but like when he traded and got Ujman Jang, right, guys, and traded those two picks that we were, you know, could turn out to be next year, or we could have traded for next year to move up the draft or whatever. Like he traded those picks out. Why did he trade those picks out if he was done with? We're not done with the rebuild. Like he's thinking, we have Chet, we have all these guys in place. We're going to make the playoffs, so there's no reason to have all these extra draft picks. We'll just have our singular singular draft pick right here and that's it you know and i think that's the key what we're trying to look at with this team is that you know sam presti is is really thinking of the next level like why did sam presti pick uzman jang first instead of j-dub well i think it has everything to do with the fact that j-dub he recognized is going to be a superstar talent and he wanted as much you know like oh god i hate saying it but like an std you know what i'm saying like it burns like a motherfucker right I think sometimes you see Sam Presti make a slight move, right? And I think this is one of those moves that he made because every single time that you're going to look at the 2022 draft, you're going to see the Clippers pick go to the Thunder, and that's J-Dub. It's not looking at Usman Jang. It's looking at J-Dub going to the Clippers. And I think that's something that's going to burn for the rest of your fucking life. (laughs) Man. All right. Well, yeah, I mean – when you add it all up and, and you can take any player that we have now and you'd be like, Oh, how do we get them? Like there are some players that are from our draft, but a lot of them are from other teams draft picks. Right. And that's been an incredible thing mm. that <clears throat> combined with watching these players get the space they need to develop. I wonder sometimes if some of these players have developed even faster than the organization could have anticipated, you know, like, do you think they really thought Shea would be this good this soon? You know, do you think that they really had any idea about that? And I think as they start going down the list and you start watching the players develop, you do start wondering how many players they could really bring in as, as rookies. And next year, if we keep our pick, which I'm assuming we will, and we have Chet, which I'm assuming we will, then we're talking about two new rookies. And you look at how many rookies we've really been able to give consistent minutes this year, it's just two. So I think it's not a bad you know spot to be in with two rookies going forward. And overall, just kind of like recognizing if you want to have the longest window, you can, it's going to become, it's going to come from drafting players and giving them time to develop. Hmm. So it's, it's been fun with the formula is really simple, but man, it takes a lot of patience from an or- organization. And then as fans, it's fun. Cause you get to watch like for small little signs instead of like, Oh, that big news of a huge trade. You're looking for like progress here progress from this player and that's i mean that's fun that's fun to me for sure yeah i I agree man and i think that's a really good way of looking at how to watch this team is is first of all you got to have a positive outlook you got to understand where this team is trying to go to um a lot of these other teams that are saying we they feel like we're and i heard this the other day and it's kind of driving me crazy is a borderline tank team Mm. you know um, that's what they call this thunder team. Uh, this thunder team is a borderline, t- and they're they're a, a podcast inside of our organization too. So a borderline tank team. You look at that and you're saying, okay, you know that's kind of like looking at the glass half empty, right? Instead of half full, right? And and that's where this entire mindset comes at is that this is the beginning of the of the year. This beginning of the year is is understanding. Okay, we lost Chet. Okay, where is this team going? Redefining that. Where can this un- um, team go from here? It's just like Sam Presti says. Every single year, it's blank slate. I need to understand what this team's going to do. So I understand that this team has some rough patches. Would we have win- won 20 games at this point with Chet? I think we'd be close to 20 wins right now with Chet. All right? 
So if you're looking at that and you're saying, how in the world could that be a disastrous season that we have 14 wins? It's not. How could you call that a, um, a tank or um, a borderline tank team? We're not because look how close we are to winning what six of the, um, all six of the last right. games. We got two overtimes. We've got a couple losses by two. Like we're so close. And every time, single time that Mark and I get off of here, I always look at Mark and I always say, dude, think about it, man. We're so close to getting 10 to 12 wins in a row. And if we get 10 to 12 wins in a row, we're not sitting at a position that we're out of the playoffs. We're sitting in a position we're in the top um, six teams in the West. And, and that's the thing about this team is we're all so very, very close for something great to happen. And why in the world are we rooting for this team to go for a tank when we're so close for something great to happen? And that's why I keep on going, going back to this is that I think that this year is a special year because there's going to be some ups and there's going to be some downs, but the ups are going to outweigh so many downs. And it's going to be such a spectacular time to watch this team that you got to just sit back and enjoy the developmental aspect of it. And just being patient with each of these guys, instead of when Poku takes a shot, be like, what the fuck Poku, right? Mark, what do I call Poku? Big shot Poku. <laughs> Big shot Poku guys, right? Fuck that shit, man. Like, this is where it all comes back to, right? Is instead of taking a negative, take a positive out of this. Each one of these players, they are fucking human beings and calling them names yeah. and saying shit about them on Twitter and shit like that. It doesn't make fucking sense because they're fucking human beings and that much that's their kids. Yeah. They're under 21. They can't even the buy a drink just right turned now, 21. Well, there we go. Poku can buy <laughs> a drink just people turned, now. I think yesterday, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yesterday, they oh, wow. something. Happy birthday, Poku. For sure. Happy birthday, Poku. Yeah. <laughs> So along these lines, right, I, I'm going to read something. This was posted on Welcome to Loud City. Uh, it's Oklahoma City Thunder blog. I don't want to na name the author because I'm going to say something about his intelligence, but we'll let you guys find it if you want. It's an article about Dort, okay, and it's, re it's called Redefining Lou Dort's Role on the Oklahoma City Thunder, which I think is a you know suspicious title from the beginning. But here's a quote from it, and when you hear this quote, you realize that this person is obviously smart, but... Like, being smart isn't good enough because they're not quite applying it. Now, here's the quote. Dort's inconsistency can be linked to a lack of focused development on the part of the coaching staff. Coach Dagnall preaches a philosophy in which the entire skill set is worked on, not just individual areas. His approach as a whole has worked effectively, but is not ideal for a player like Lou Dort. See, like, he got... Perfect. He nailed it. Like, this is the right thing to do, so he understands it, but then he says but it's bad for Dort. Like this type of stuff like really blows my mind because as a whole, that philosophy he um, talked about with coach Dagnall and developing as a whole player, that is the important thing, right? So it's saying, okay, but now we want to exclude one player from that because when he shoots, it scares me. Like that's ridiculous. The whole team is in this position. It goes for every single player and we're going to benefit as a whole. We just need to avoid getting impatient and, I don't know. Sometimes when I feel this way, I get upset. George, how do you handle it when you feel like this? You know, it just got what I always, uh, philosophy of mine, let the haters hate, you know? So, right. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're, if you don't have, what do they say? If you don't have any haters, you, then you ain't doing something right or something. Cause like, right. So Dort, Dort, he's, he's still young too, still developing, but this guy, he's in the long run, he's going to be our defensive guy. And right now, you know, we're trying to develop him into something else. We've had another defensive guy, and I love Andre Robertson, but this guy wouldn't even shoot the three. So now we got right. a guy that is willing to shoot the three, and he makes some of them, and he's not too bad at it, especially the corner three. Now, I will say sometimes right. I cringe up when he shoots it from the from the top, but when he's in that corner, I know it's going in. I was like, oh, yep, bucket, and he gets it. So, I mean, I, I really like Dort. But a lot of times, I don't even read. Depending on who wrote it, I don't even read some of those things. So, yeah, it's a better to to avoid it if it's gonna like me get me all yeah. emotional and stuff. And look, I feel the same sense. Like when Dort is out there, you know, and it doesn't feel like it's going in, you know, and it's kind of like a little bit of like, oh crap, you know. And I, but at the same time, some of those have started going yeah. in, and more importantly, you see defenders running out at True. him. And as long as they are closing out on him, it's going to open space. And if you can take and say, like, okay, each three-pointer he shoots that we, like, the average fan might consider bad or low percentage, it seems like he's taking the ball away from them through an offensive charge equal amount of times. So it's like he earns the possessions. Maybe that's not what everybody wants. But if you were to sit him on the, on the bench, then 
it, you know, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be better off, right? Like that wouldn't necessarily help things. So yes, we want to see him and continue to improve. Yeah. And obviously as his shot improves, the percentage will go up and then people will start feeling like, Hey, that has a better chance to go in. He's shown consistency for stretches, a whole season worth of consistency. That's going to take time. But each year he kind of comes in with a, a new role. Yeah. And I think that's important for every player, especially on a young team, because Dave, you were mentioning at the beginning, like you get to certain peaks and you start to plateau. And if you want to grow, you have to go into a new experience and yeah. being asked to do something new on either end of the court. is really important. So I think it's a, it's a way to help players stop from becoming, and I've got nothing wrong with Andre Robertson, but exactly like you said, George, where it's a player who won't shoot it. So the team doesn't respect him. So basically like his main effective offense was when, Everybody forgot he was on the court. He would cut back door for an alley yeah. like, and it's like that. That's good, but you can't in modern NBA have four guys who play offense and one guy who plays defense. You know that used to fly, but it doesn't. You nailed it there. You're absolutely right, man. And and I think that's again when when you're looking at Dort and understanding him and understanding the future of this team and and where the path is with this team. Um, if you don't think that Dort fits, then then that's fine. Um. In your mind, you trade them, all right? You get whatever assets you get in, in return for Dort. Those assets will never turn into a Dort player, right? okay, ever, okay, first of all. Second of all, you're going to watch Dort eventually um, add, I don't know, what, have three, four, maybe five seasons in his career where he averages 20-plus points a game? Yeah. You know, like how many... How many of you guys want to watch Dort do that for a different team while playing some of the best defense in the league? I, I don't yeah. want to do that. I don't want to be part of that. I, you know what I want? I want more than anything to Dort to figure it out yeah. himself at this point of his life. Yeah. I want I want to be there. I want to I want to be a part of the the fan base when Dort all of a sudden goes off and then guess what? Game seven, Dort goes off and has forty five points. Yep. And all those fuckers that have been hating him, all those all of a sudden they all are buying Dort jerseys. Mm -hmm. You know, like, or at I least want to be up. there when the change happens. Yeah. You know, I want to be part of this team when the change happens. I want him to be part of this team when the change happens because it's coming fast. Because somebody like Dort, he, he doesn't just have, you know, baseline, baseline years where he's going to average only 15 points a year. Right? That, that's not what he's going to do his entire career. I mean, he's going to have these moments where it's like, whoop, 20 points, boom, you know? Four, you know, 16 points, boom, 22 points. You know, like, it's going to go like this for a little while. I'm hoping towards the end of his career, and especially around that 26 years where we talked about that, that peak years that is so crucial for these young players is that 26 to 28 years, I'm hoping that he can peak out that year, those years because those are going to be the championship years yeah. for us. And you know, he, you know? he's going to do it too because he's a hard worker because he wouldn't oh, be yeah. where he is right now if it wasn't for his work ethic. So I think that's Ever. another thing to Sam Presti. He chooses the character of these guys, and he is uh, the epitome of the type of character that Sam Presti looks for. Um, you know, he went undrafted, and he still never gave up. There's no quit in this guy. So, mm. you know, I do think he will reach a higher higher uh, position than he is now. So, Yeah, but, absolutely. I think that's probably a great place to to start to wrap it up. I'll let you guys add whatever you want, but when you talk about – Presti, it's about seeing things the way they can be versus the way they are. And when we're talking about watching development, that's what we want to do. It's it's easy to look at somebody's stats and be like, okay, they're a bad shooter. But can you say, here's what they need to work on, here's how they're going to improve, and here's where they could be in two, three, four, five years. And if you can do those things, this is the right team for you because this is full of projects. There's full of things, but like it's also – because of a player like Shea, like having number two out there means that you get to watch a superstar every night and you get to watch a player, a lot of players who are taking, you know, their steps toward the next level. And that's, it's a beautiful place to be in. We're enjoying every day. We want to win every game. It's a bummer when we don't, yeah. but at the same time, like there are no losses. Mm. And let's talk about the biggest win here. We have two picks, two picks that have been our original picks on this team. That's Chet and that's Josh Giddy. Everybody else on this team has been an add-on or a not on undrafted player, but most of them have been add-ons. A, a, a trade here, a trade there, 
um, adding this player second round from a trade here, adding this player, Trey Mann, um, from the trade uh, from the Clippers. You know, like it's insane, guys, that we have a team that's built like we have, okay, with only two of the picks that are our original draft mm-hmm. picks. Everybody else has been from trades and, and adding young players and draft, um, you know, drafted players early on in their careers and making them believe. And then you have guys like Dort and Kenny Hustle and Mike Muscala that run this fucking team and the heart the fucking team and teaching these young players how to play because now they have set a bar for each one of these guys to play hard. And you can see it in every fucking game. These guys are putting it out there. And that's what's so impressive and why I keep on looking at it as this team and the way that Sam Presti has drafted them and put this team together is the biggest win of all. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm for sure looking forward to tonight against the Spurs. Uh, I think the young guys will have, you know, a, a fun tonight. And, you know, that's the good thing about having a young team is that when we face another young team, that, you know, it's going to be competitive. They're not going to sleep on it. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Good, good to see Isaiah Roby every time we can. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, the Spurs are obviously a team that we like to beat anytime we get the chance, even in preseason. So hmm. we'll get after it. I'm hoping for a win. And um, let's see. Maybe Shea will go out there and, um, Set a new career high because it felt like it felt like he was just playing with a tip. Anyway, we'll leave it there. We just appreciate the tip, everybody baby. joining us, just and the tip. we will see you soon. Thunder up, everybody. Thunder up.